So for those following along at home, Emily is playing a whole lot of video games in order to unwind after being stressed about missing a group project due to a spam folder misfire which she missed due to video games. That about where we are? I still feel like we probably just shouldn't have mentioned the video games at all. But, you know, yeah. maybe that's just me. That sounds a lot like an everybody else problem rather than an Emily problem. I feel like here in the, in the distant future, we should understand that people just want to play video games continuously rather than do basically anything else. But what if? You should respect that. What if the video games were work? Hmm. Well, then I guess we'd have really played ourselves, huh? Anyway, the pincers have an upgraded variant, the boss pincer. It called the boss pincer because it wears an eye patch. That's it, that's the joke. Otherwise it behaves more or less identically to the red ones. You know, other than having some extra stats, but that's pretty much... That's not really... Noteworthy, is it? I mean, stats don't really matter a whole lot in this game, so... Like, I mean, outside of, like, extreme disparities. I mean, stats matter. It's just, it's, most of your stats come from equipment, but like having, like, more attack than they have defense gets numbers to happen. Like, I was doing um, runs in order to clean up stuff to get the uh, encyclopedias and stuff sorted. And, like, when I, if I try to keep a combat streak going, even if I have a whole bunch of regen stuff, it's notable that you still get worn down pretty quickly if you're not being, like, fully careful about fighting stuff. By the way, speaking of encyclopedias, does it seem like we've missed something? Like, I, I have this strange feeling that we've forgotten to do something that's probably important. Ah, I'm sure it'll come back to me. We're now officially in the middle of Maroon Valley, by the way. I mean middle in like the both the literal geographic and the time we're gonna spend solving it senses. I'm gonna show the map a couple times as we go around here. It's basically show that we've we're going in a very slow, very wide circle around the place. And the middle of Maroon Valley is basically just full of a lot of enormous pits with a lot of jump ramps crisscrossing it and half of them are deactivated and it's a whole thing. I fucking love Maroon Valley so much. It's so convoluted. But once again I can respect the contrary position. I guess this was a one-way gate by the way. Like I almost didn't walk up to that. And yeah, here we are. We've gone in a big circle, although I guess we kind of had to at least go a little bit that way because of that one-way gate. Still no closer on figuring out how to get up to those ramps, by the way. I mean, if they really wanted to have... to, re to really get under your skin... I mean, like, if if I was designing something like this, I'd just put a ramp up there, and there, there would be no way to access it. That ramp would just be there, and you would be left to wonder how or why anybody could ever get there. Yeah, this is why you don't design video games. It's for everybody's safety, you see. It's like, for all the stuff, for all of the 
for all of the convolution, for all of the things that there actually are to complain about. This game is super fair about telegraphing stuff. Like, it's... stuff is signposted everywhere. The game often just puts little groups of players up in places for no real reason. They don't have any dialogue, they're, they're not part of any quest. They're just there to telegraph that, hey, you can get up here, somehow. It's like all the designs on the floors and the puzzle bits. The game's got a language and you can absolutely learn it. Oh yeah, no, like the, ga the game does a really good job of showcasing where you can and ac can not like actually go. I just think it would be funny to just, like, I wouldn't even do it, like, much. I'd just have, like, one. Just one ramp up there. And it would be, like, the only one that I put in the entire game. But it would be there so solely to be, like, how do you get there? You don't. I just put that there. See, if I were doing that, I might do that, but I would eventually have the game, something in the game, cop to it. I'd be like, yeah... No, that's not actually accessible, but I would spell it out. And if it were in this game, I would have said, oh, it's just the developers. It's just the developers trolling everybody. They're just like that. They've got these notions about how you should make video games. And it would be completely on brand in a game like this. This game is absolutely, it does that thing where it just, I'm not even sure it was intentional, it just kind of winds up, kind of incidentally, accidentally even, being just a tiny little bit of a treatise on game design. Like, how can you not be with this kind of conceit? I mean, I feel like that's a little unfair because... There, I mean, this game is not unique in that it has a certain design philosophy and things that it thinks are good or acceptable. Like, you can pull just about any game you want out of the ether and have an almost instant treasure trove of things to discuss with regards to what do the developers, you know, what... What do they think is good design? What do they think is acceptable to make the player do? Etc. Etc. Oh yeah. I just think that that's you you don't you don't have to think as much in order to get at that stuff in this game. Like it's not hidden, it's almost overt. How a couple of times it actually is overt. It's just I mean, every every game does this to an extent. It's like you said, you can... I, I like to joke sometimes that games tell the story of their own development, and it becomes a little bit less of a joke every time I say it, but... This game, that's especially true. Like, you can feel the devs' priorities changing as you go through the game, and you're actually going through all of these chapters that came out in Early Access in order and they were there, and they got the feedback, and it keeps changing in response to the feedback. And like, I can actually hear everybody saying, oh well, I thought Temple Mine was great, but it was a bit long. And they wind up making these other dungeons that are approximately as difficult. Oh, they're a little bit more difficult, but they're shorter and they're denser. And I can just see this happening. It's almost literally true with CrossCode. I suppose just about anything that takes a long time, anything that spends a significant amount of time in early access is going to have that it, that effect, eventually. Yeah, I guess. That said, there is another very specific observation that occurred to me at one point when I was playing this, which is that, God help me, it reminds me of Golden Sun. You might know that I hate Golden Sun. Although I didn't when I first played it because I was an idiot teenager and I didn't really have much of a developed taste in video games, but 
the I'm always down to complain a lot about Golden Sun, and how convoluted its designs were, and, you know, several other things about it, but, like, this game kind of seems like the way that I remember feeling the first time about Golden Sun before I figured out that actually I hated it. It had these enormous sprawling areas that you take these enormous routes around that eventually lead somewhere. And in retrospect, they were really tedious, but you also kind of have to respect the scale of them. This game does a lot of that. Like, remember about 20 seconds ago when we went on a huge loop around like five different screens and we got up to a chest and Emily was like, well, this better be worth it. Narrator, it was not. It, but it turns out it's actually a, a unique equipment that actually has several um, upgraded versions of it that you can trade for, but they all start with this one. You have to get it here. It makes enemies drop more credits. It's, it's not bad, except that money is not usually that much of a problem. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't remember money ever really being an issue, so... But yeah, this game seems to me sometimes like the way I remember Golden Sun. Like, it's just got that... That scale to it. That slight relentlessness, except I feel like it makes it work. And I can't fully qualify exactly what this game does with its sprawling overlapping dungeon designs that Golden Sun didn't. And in order to actually tell you that, I would have to actually go and play Golden Sun again in detail. This shot, that can't have been the intended path, right? But... But it was a trick shot and it worked, and that's all that matters. God, I love this game. I love this stupid game so much. I feel like that is in and of itself a pretty big aspect of the thing you were just discussing, because <laughs> I admit it has been a very long time since I've played Golden Sun. I also did not like it, but that was more on the aspect of most of the exploration and the puzzles, and, and I'm going to use the word puzzles very loosely when it comes to Golden <laughs> Sun, but they were all very... They're very tedious. There's no real... How did I do this? I... Excuse me? What? You saw that, or rather you didn't, but no, never mind. Go on. You were, you were in the middle of something. Don't let my bullshit cut off your flow. But, like, you know, Golden Sun, as it's laid out, is... It's... It's very... Is it... It, it does have all of these big overlapping routes, yes, but they never amount to anything. They're just busy work. Whereas this game, for all of its faults, and with regards to being on its bullshit at all times, mm -hmm. it... No one can say that it does not... Yeah. It does not commit to that. It, no one can say it does not commit. Because it absolutely does. Even even when it sends you on those long five-screen disaster routes, you always get something. It never leaves you empty-handed. And it's breezy. Like, it just keep, you can just go. It keeps the pace up. It doesn't make you stop and open a menu every other interaction and pick another fucking synergy. God, I'm starting to remember it now. I feel like that's a pretty big benefit as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, even though the, the things that this game gives you are not always good, I mean, like like we said, one of the, we went on that big route and we got a hat that gives us more money, even though money is not and never yeah. will be a problem. Yeah, I think I've said before that you, you kind of have to accept in this game that the the chests are never really a sufficient reward for anything. It's always, always about you figured a thing out and you got to the end, and that that has to be enough. Oh yeah, no, th this game has some extremely big journey, not the destination energy. Mm hmm. And I mean, and that said, that particular one was at least a unique piece of equipment. 
that you can't get anywhere else that does a thing that no other equipment does, except for the things that you can trade it for. So, you know. That's fair. That's not nothing. That does make it better than the average cross-code platforming sequence. Yeah, I mean, normally you just get a couple sandwiches for doing that stuff. I'm also not really sure about that shot. Like, it, it kind of turns into a, a kind of a running joke with uh, several of the shots in Maroon Valley that I, I never quite figured out what the intended ways of doing most of them were. Like, maybe some of them actually are intended to be, no, you sit here and you calculate the perfect trick shot. But I also feel like I cheesed a couple of them. And I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, actually, that's a lie. I know exactly how I feel about that. It's just that I, I feel like three different ways about it. And most of them are just variations on I love this stupid game. I guess that's the thing. This game just goes with it. It knows what you're doing. It's happy to go with you. When the chips are down, it doesn't want to get in your way. I think it has a pretty good grasp on how much of it there is. Most of the time. Honestly, we were talking about the, the dungeons and the, the variance in how the game handles the dungeons and the fact that the content doesn't get any easier, but it does get denser. And it actually just recently came up in the thread that one of the things that I think Temple Wine does that future dungeons are going to maybe drop the ball on a bit is, is pacing. That Temple Mine has the downtime. Just to, only a little bit. I mean, Temple Mine's idea of downtime is, let's not forget, making you do a triple ricochet shot to unlock a door. But it has it. whole lot of content in this game and it just sometimes it's able to offset the relentlessness if not the content itself just a tiny bit that is fair maroon valley definitely can feel uh pretty relentless like you cannot take a step in this place without encountering something that's like a ramp that's not turned on or a barrier that's still up or some kind of thing that you have to make on a trick shot from a place that you can't get to right now it's just the knot the knot is real once you get to untying it this game has a way of it designs itself in a way that once you start getting stuff done it usually becomes pretty apparent to just unravel the thread, to just to grab it and pull it and see where it goes. And it will, it will usually take you somewhere that's sensible, and you'll usually start making progress at a pretty decent clip. Once you get that first grasp on something. That is... But, that is the problem, most of the time. Hmm. Hmm. Because until then you're still wandering around, pretty much lost. It turns out that we can absolutely relate to it taking too long to fill out the map, but I don't think that's what you guys were talking about. So yeah. yeah, you know, just just casually drop the whole. Actually, you know, we're we're here charting the entire Milky Way galaxy. You know, no big deal. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So in case you know the subtext and the the logs that I've already posted weren't enough, let's just come out and say the quiet part loud. 
uh, cross code, as in cross code not cross worlds, is set in a extremely post spacefaring society where we are straight colonizing the galaxy. Humanity is everywhere. We've got FTL travel, although we have to go everywhere the first time the slow way in order to get it to work. That sounds like kind of a pain. That's what that guy was doing. But yeah. And in the midst of all that, a company decided basically to purchase a planet and just turn it into an interactive telepresence theme park. Because I guess that's just normal. So that's capitalism, baby. What is space if not there to be colonized and turned into profit? Sounds like a waste not to, honestly. Also, I, I did a tiny little bit of editing because I completely forgot to go back and get up to this point the first time going through this area. This has actually already happened a couple times and I guess viewers were just too polite to point it out. But every now and then if you're really pointlessly careful about scrutinizing these videos, you can see our HP total is jumping around. Sometimes. I'm sorry, I'm a bad Let's Player. So, so you're not supposed to admit to your faults that you fixed with editing says creating a fault that I'm going to fix with editing. Look, 